Did I say his name right? Almost. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's off camera, right? <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hurdy Gurdy Cafe, an hour of interviews, music, and camaraderie. I'm Ryan, and I'll be your host along this crazy adventure through the land of the wheel fiddle. So strap in, and let's see what's cranking in the Hurdy Gurdy community today. And welcome back, everyone, to the Hurdy Gurdy Cafe podcast. We're here at season two. We have a wonderful guest today. Many of you know her and probably are inspired by her, Toby Miller. Um, she is a virtuoso of the Baroque Hurdy Gurdy, and she performs in various formations, which we'll, we'll talk about today. So we've got a lot of questions for her, and we want to welcome her. Welcome, Toby. It's great to have you. Well, thanks very much. It's nice to be here. Yes. And before we get started uh, with our, our exploration of your music and your work today, um, we're going to listen to one of the tracks that you wanted to feature. So what, what was the first track that you wanted to feature? So the first track is the first movement um, of a set of pieces by Dupuis. And this set of pieces is actually called La Dupuis. So they're uh, pièces de caractère, character pieces. And um, this is sort of the last set of pieces in the section of pieces in C, um, which is... I guess his piece um, okay. in his character, and it's the first part, première partie. Excellent. All right, well, let's have a listen. Okay, well, we're back again with Toby Miller. So Toby, why did you choose this particular uh, section of music to, to feature in our podcast today? How, how does it inspire you? Um, Dupuis the, was a composer for Hurdy Gurdy, but he was also a Hurdy Gurdy teacher. Um, and for me, one of the most important, both as a composer and as a pedagogue from the period, he was officially a Hurdy Gurdy teacher and a harpsichord teacher and wrote a method book for the Hurdy Gurdy, which gives us more information than anybody else actually 
about a lot of specific things, including articulation and dynamics. He set up his own um, dynamic markings. There's another method which appears 20 years later by Bouin, which does similar things. Right. But what Dupuis does is at the end of his method, he has a set of six sonatas. And in these sonatas, he uses his markings to show you what you should do with the trompette and what you should do with the dynamics. Excellent. Um, so his set of pièces de caractère mm. is, for me, sort of a continuation of these sonatas, but they're character pieces. They're short pieces arranged in suites, um, and they explore a lot of these same things. And mm. this particular movement, this first movement, has a lot of double stops, so playing more than one note at the same, at the same time, which on a violin you would do by stopping two strings at once, and on a hurdy-gurdy you actually have to, it's like a trill almost, you hold the lower note and and trill to the to the upper note. Right. And he does not only that, but also marks through articulations what you should do with the trompette. Right. So it's sort of a virtuosic piece, which I think is showing what he would like to do as a as a player and as a composer. Excellent. And he, we know that he worked very closely with um, with the fa most famous hurdy-gurdy player of the time, who is known to us as l'illustre Dongui, the illustrious Dongui. Mm -hmm. And he wrote in his the introduction actually to this work, to the pièce de caractère, he said, look, these pieces might be a little bit shocking for you, um, but just know I've played them together with my friend Dongui and we both found them very pleasing. So if you have any problems, don't be afraid to come and, um, and address me personally. What, what made them possibly shocking? I mean, what, what, what about them is shocking? Well, at the time we have, um, I think how to describe that best. There are basically two styles of music going on in the 18th century for, um, in 18th century France for the hurdy-gurdy. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of simpler style of music which is written for amateurs more or less. And these amateurs were people of the nobility um, who didn't necessarily play so well. We know, for example, that the queen was not the best hurdy-gurdy player, but she loved to play. There are some, some reports of people having had to listen to her again, again. <laughs> And not being so, not being so pleased. Uh, so there's this sort of nobility that's actually responsible for the hurdy-gurdy becoming very popular. Uh -huh. And at the same time, you have um, a smaller group of virtuos or professional players, such as Dongui, but also such, such as Baton, who was the son of the instrument maker who was really responsible for developing the hurdy-gurdy in the 18th century into what we know it today. Right. Um, and also Ravé, we don't know his first name, just Monsieur Ravé and Bouin, who wrote another method, and Dupuis, of course. So we have this sort of group of virtuoso players, and Dupuis um, pushed the style of music written for these virtuoso players to another level. So mm -hmm. in this sort of simpler music, which the amateurs were playing, which is just suites of dances and things, um, which were you know, in, sort of in the, in the classical French style, right. but inspired by the countryside. Um, I see. Which is not to say that they were folk music because they're not. They're this idealized version of the folk music for the nobility who like to dress up and pretend at being peasants. For <laughs> okay, so what, what you're telling me is that there's there's kind of two levels of music here, and it's not quite folk music. But if you want to kind of play a little bit, you can learn these. But then there's also this more virtuoso aspect when you finally get good. Yeah. Yeah, it's not folk music at all. It's um, it's it's. You know, like the ladies at court would dress up to like like they were peasants, like, um, <laughs> and it was just it was the style of the day. So it's this sort of stylized pastoral music we would call it. Do you play any of that? Yes, of course. And there's a, it's a huge repertoire. But uh -huh. for example, with this particular CD, the Belle Vieuse, which is the first CD we did with my ensemble, we were looking to um, to show this other type of music. And what Dupuis did was to take this to other levels also harmonically to, uh -huh. because you have the problem of the drone on the hurdy-gurdy. Uh -huh. And then you have the harmonies which are played on the harpsichord. And these often clash a bit, you have suddenly the not just the relationship of what you play as a hurdy-gurdy player against the drone, but also against the harmonies. Mm -hmm. And Dupuis really, really pushed, pushed this. He takes some, sometimes he goes on, I mean, not, not in this particular movement that we listen to, but he goes, he modulates into mm -hmm. places where you normally wouldn't go against a C or against a G drone. Mm -hmm. And he's sort of there saying, look, this is all possible that we can play this sort of normal music, which would have been played on other, other instruments. 
right. um, which were not not pastoral instruments. You well, can do I, the same thing on a hurdy gurdy. I, I really, I really wish Sergio was here. And, and by the way, those of you who are wondering, where is Sergio? Well, we're wondering that too. Usually, he pulls the uh, the I'm Spanish card. <laughs> So we're going to wait and see if he shows up today. Um, but so hopefully I've he'll show up. Him. Maybe he doesn't actually exist. <laughs> That's true. If you haven't met him, he might not. <laughs> but w when you're talking about these two different oh, kinds exactly. of music, no, I'm interested because I had no idea that this was a thing. So when you are working with people and you're teaching them, do you try to teach them from this more simpler version and then graduate them up to more professional type virtuoso pieces? Or, or do you just teach them what they, they want to know? Um, it really depends on the player. Mm -hmm. um, when I give workshops for Baroque music, it's quite, it, it's actually, it's very varied. I wanted to say it's often people coming from different, different areas and playing Baroque music for the first time. And I think it's really important when you're learning to play uh, Baroque music, and especially French Baroque music, which is another step further. I mean, when we think about Baroque music, sort of normally, maybe we're thinking about Bach or Handel or Telemann. Um, and French Baroque music is another style. It's sort of, it's less in our ears. It's mm -hmm. maybe less mainstream for the, for the modern listener. Right. And there are a lot more rules that you have to learn. Um, mm -hmm. And it's another, it's another language. Right. So I usually, um, I, actually, I always think it's really important to start in the more classical French style. And this sort of virtuosic style has a lot of Italian influences has a lot, a lot more technical things like, I mean, faster things to play, for example. Right. And I really think that's maybe not the starting point for 99% <laughs> yeah. of, the, of the people, because first you have to learn the language. Right. It's like if you're learning French, for example, and you immediately want to start reciting Molière. Nice idea, but you should start, you should with, start small. You should start with small. With cat and dog. You have to and assimilate like the language first. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And um, the the ensemble d'Angui. Uh, so this is the this is the the group that performed this music, correct? Yes. And you mentioned that there was a story about the name of that. Yes. Would you mind telling us? <laughs> yes. Well, we didn't start out as ensemble d'Angui, which I think, um, in retrospect, was not the easiest name for people to pronounce who are not French speakers. <laughs> um, back when I was a student, I, um, I when I was studying in Basel. I came across a treatise from the 15th century by Paulus Paulerinos of Prague, who describes the hurdy-gurdy. Um, and he says it's an instrument with gut strings, which is often played by women. And he calls it the Isis. Okay. Um, because it was invented by the goddess Isis. Oh, okay. And Isis with a Y. Uh -huh. And back at the time, I thought, okay, perfect. That's what... That's what, that's the name I'm going to take. Hey, wait a minute, there's Sergio. Hello! <laughs> you made you it. Ne you never respect the Spanish Inquisition. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Sorry, I was late. Uh, uh, the train delay plus no battery in your cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, that's okay, <laughs> at least you're safe. We, we thought maybe you were touching up your roots. No, no, no. Oh, I have to do that. Anyway. <laughs> well, anyway, Hello, Toby. Sergio, Hello. this is Toby. Toby, Sergio. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yes. Well, before, before re recap that story you were just telling us. So, Sergio, um, Toby was telling us the story behind the name of the ensemble uh, that ah, she was... Ah, Dangui. Yes. Yes, yeah. please tell us one more time, if you don't mind. So, um, I didn't originally choose a name which was going to be so hard to pronounce for non-French speakers. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> the original name of the group was taken from a treatise by Paulus Paulerinos of Prague from the 15th century, where he describes the hurdy-gurdy as a stringed instrument with gut, well, with gut strings and usually played by women, or often played by women. Oh. And he calls it Isis because yeah. it was invented by the goddess Isis. And that's the hurdy gurdy was invented by the goddess Isis. Yes. Oh, I did not know that. Okay. okay. Neither did I. Yes. Um, and I and I came into contact with this work as it, when I was a student when I was studying medieval music in Basel, um, and at the time thought, oh, that's perfect, great name for a group. It's a long time ago, and so we took that name. And then um, some some years later, in the in the media, Isis became became used as the name for some. Terrorist. Yes. Terrorists. Oh, yes. And we had a very, very quick name change. And I thought, um, I thought, I thought about it quite a lot. And Dongyi was the biggest virtuoso 
of the hurdy-gurdy in the 18th century. He's the one, um, he's just referred to as l'illustre d'Anguy, the illustrious d'Anguy. We don't actually know his first name. Um, I know that Michel Lemieux has been doing a lot of research about this lately. He's a mm -hmm. French musicologist. He actually wrote the program notes for the Vivaldi Chez de Ville City that we did. Yeah. And somebody I've worked quite a lot with. He's, he's fantastic um, and is somebody who loves to do this sort of research of going through all the old newspapers of the time looking for traces of people. <laughs> so he's been doing nice. a lot of research and even suggested that it might be more than one person. It might actually be a like a couple of generations. Right. The uh, so Isis though I'm stuck on that. Um, yes. Is this the the Egyptian goddess Isis? Yes. So the goddess of magic. I guess okay. So. Well, that makes yeah. sense. All right. I mean, I, get this. I, get I think he was just making it up. There's abs there's absolutely no evidence that the hurdy goody goes back to that period. I mean, could you really though? Could you really though prove that a god invented something or a goddess invented something? You, you couldn't. That's a very theoretical question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But you were talking about you're talking you about, to take that. <laughs> you're talking about someone going through all the, the paperwork of, of, of the time, the newspapers and things. And uh, yeah. right, be right before we started recording, we were talking about Barnaby Walters. And um, he told me uh, once that uh, when he was getting into Billy and Hurdy Gurdies, that um, he went back through all of these um, old uh, like Internet forum document things and found all kinds of uh, questions that you, you were putting forth about the hurdy-gurdy. And so I'm kind of curious, that leads me to, uh, how did you come to the hurdy-gurdy? How did you get started in the hurdy-gurdy? Wow, um, the hurdy-gurdy is not my first instrument. Right. I don't know if you, do you want the long story or the short story? Well, Please, you know, the long got, one. <laughs> yeah, if you've got time, we'll do the long one. Right. Um, my first instrument was the violin, actually. Ooh. And I started when I was three years old. Both wow. of my parents are musicians. Uh, my mother, they're both retired now. My mother was a violinist and my father played tuba in the symphony orchestra for 50 years. Wow. He got his yeah. first job at 18. So it's another, really another, another era. Right. And one of my first memories is actually being three years old and my mother on the phone with the piano teacher because my parents wanted me to play the piano. And I was terrified of this huge instrument with so many keys. <laughs> and I really wanted to play the violin. And I remember really strongly that there was something about the overtones, the harmonic spectrum of the violin that was like magic mm -hmm. to me. That was really the instrument I wanted to play. Um, so I insisted and I made my mother call back piano teacher and cancel. And I had <laughs> violin lessons. Ah. Wow. So and I she listened though. That's a, that's a beautiful thing. Yes, she did listen. <laughs> so I started on the violin. And some years later, I actually switched to piano. <laughs> I <wrote> oh, <laughs> nice. So... <laughs> I played really everything growing up. Um, and then I played, I played recorder. Um, I was singing a lot, actually. That's sort of my, my other instrument. Yeah. And we would go on, on trips with, with my choir. And a lot of the children played recorder in school. But mm -hmm. I didn't. And I was very jealous. So I begged until I got a recorder and I taught <laughs> myself to play. So I played recorder. Yeah. And um, then when I got to secondary school, I wanted to join the wind ensemble. And they said, no way. It's not a real <laughs> instrument. <laughs> Ah, oh, come on! <laughs> so I played the modern flute. They sort of put that in my hands. There was a quick moment of me trying to play the trumpet. It was terrible. <laughs> I played a lot of different things. And I actually started my studies in modern flute. Okay. Um, and I hated it. I was... Oh. It was really not my instrument. And I remember people would look at me and say, yeah, but you're like a guitarist or, or something <laughs> else. And after one year, I discovered that there was an early music program. And then you could study the recorder. So I yeah. put my flute in the closet, pulled up my recorders um, and re-auditioned mm -hmm. and ended up studying recorder and early music, which was really, which was really my, my, the music I loved the most. I mean, as a teenager, I would mm -hmm. buy, I would buy old records, um, old LPs of, of recordings of 16th, 17th, 18th century music and also earlier medieval music and dance around to them in my room. You shouldn't be saying that on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> but I just really loved it. And when I was studying modern flutes, I just wanted to play Baroque music. And my teacher, who was in the symphony orchestra, just didn't, didn't really know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. So I think that's where my heart always was. And it was, it was like a revelation that you could study early music, get a degree in it, historical performance. Um, and yeah, it was, it was fantastic. And all the things about the modern 
classical world that I didn't like, actually. And I mean, I grew up in that world. I spent mm -hmm. my childhood in symphony orchestra rehearsals whenever there was no school. My parents wouldn't get a babysitter for me. They would just send me <laughs> to work. Um, and so, I mean, I grew up in that world, but it's a very, it's a very strict world in the sense that you have a lot of, um, there are a lot of traditions. If you play a, a piece, you should play it in the way your teacher plays it. And there's not a lot of room, at least at the time, it's, maybe it's changed, that was a long time ago. But there wasn't a lot of room for improvisation. There wasn't a lot of room for personal, really personal interpretations. Mm -hmm. um, and early music is, early music, the, um, the, the music, for example, the written down music, is, it doesn't give you so much information. Mm -hmm. There aren't usually dynamic markings written in, maybe the odd piano forte, um, but there's really very little in the music. So a lot of that, it really has to come from you. And there's an idea that every interpretation, every performance is the first time. Right. Because nice. with, in, the, in the sense that it, at the time, there were no CDs, there were no records, tapes. So every time you were listening to something, it was new. And so you always have to add something new. It always has to be in the moment, in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That you ornament differently, you play different dynamics. It's, it's always a bit new. So I was completely um, enamored, enamored with early music and um, starting to work as well in a medieval ensemble where I was singing and playing recorder. And really wishing I had an instrument where I could accompany myself because right. you can't really of sing, course, and, play you sing and play the recorder. Yes. Yeah, and I went to a concert and there was a hurdy gurdy, mm -hmm. and it was like the same feeling I had as a three-year-old, with the sound and the the harmonics, the, that it was it was magic, and I just knew in that moment that I had to play this instrument. Hmm. What, what what do you remember the concert? I don't remember what the program was, but the player was Ben Grossman. Oh, oh! Yes. Who's yes. my fellow Canadian? Canadian who well, who lives in Canada? I don't, but um, from Toronto. Yeah. And I actually had some lessons with him afterwards. He was sort of a mentor to me when I was starting out. Excellent. Yeah, I was told someone told me uh, that I needed to go meet Ben, and it's about six hour drive from here. So one of these well, days when I when I can, I think I will. <laughs> it was about as far for me going from Montreal. Yeah. And I went, oh. Yeah. I went, it's 600 kilometers, 500 kilometers. Yeah. Um, and as a student, I mean, I was, I was, yeah, I was a student. I didn't have a car, of course. So train or bus. And I would go <laughs> from time to time to take some lessons. And after a while, it became very much, we would, we would sort of sit and talk shop and eat chocolate. And <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> so, and, and you mentioned... You mentioned that you came to the, the Hurdy Gurdy after all of this. And I, I guess my curiosity was, you know, one of the reasons I loved Hurdy Gurdy was because I love the violin. I really always loved the violin. And um, and I thought this was my way of, of playing kind of like the violin, even though I couldn't play the violin. <laughs> I think it's sort of like apples and oranges. They're both yes, yes. yes, probably, yes. But I can understand you, Ryan, because I, <laughs> I bought myself a very fancy violin from the 1800s. I tried to play it, really. Yeah. And... Nope. <laughs> it, 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 it's just the, the same feeling as uh, what Toby said uh, with, the, with the modern flute. It was like, mm, no, this, is, this thing is not for me. Even right. though I love how it sounds, to play it, for me, it was psh, very, yeah. very difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think an instrument, as a musician, I think you really have a relationship with your instrument. Totally. And it has to fit with you. Um, and whether or not that's the type of instrument or the specific instrument that you have, mm -hmm. it really, right. yeah. Well, everyone seems to, I mean, everyone that I've talked to seems to have that same kind of moment where they just know that they should be playing this. I mean, e even in my own life, I, I played mandolin and guitar, but once I heard the Hurdy Gurdy played a certain way, I immediately knew I need to figure out how, how to get one of those and play one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have that same thing too, Sergio? I think we've talked about this before. Totally, yes. On the first podcast, uh, same, same thing. Yeah. Same thing. You, you listen to it for the first time and you get like, oh, okay, yeah. what's that? I need it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you either love it or you hate it. So. It, right, right. That's, that's com completely right. Yes, 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 yes. I don't understand the hate part. I mean, I, I would understand the hate part if it was like a really screechy instrument, but like... I mean, hearing something like what you play, Toby, how could someone listen to that and say, yeah, you know what? I, mm, I don't really think I like that. 
I think I think it's so personal. I think it's how an instrument speaks to you. And I worked for a long time with a lute player, and mm -hmm. he hated it. Really? Oh. Yeah, he referred to it as the beast. Wow. <laughs> the beast. <laughs> Wow. And he just thought, no way. <laughs> and it's the oh. complete opposite of a lute in that sense, you know, that you have a sustained sound that's just uh -huh. always yes. there. And I think it just, he just didn't mm. like it. So I, I had some, so, some people uh, tell me, and I think a friend also uh, uh, told us this, eh? the, um, the, 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 the harmonic uh, context, eh? non-changing, is a, a, a topic that some musicians really, really hate. Like the, the fact that you cannot change chords and, and you are like in a more modal kind of thing. Uh, I, I got a lot of comments about, uh, about that from, from other uh, musicians. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're not going to be listening to this podcast, so let's not worry about yes. that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, if there's anybody who who's works in the field of psychology, I think it's actually a really interesting topic mm -hmm. um, to understand what part of the brain or... Um, what part of, of a person makes them identify with certain sounds or harmonies? Totally. Or do you are you a drone answer person or, you... or not? Eh? <laughs> uh, do, you, do you have the answer to that or are you just speculating on something there? I'm just speculating. Okay. I, I don't have an answer. I did not study psychology other than a semester of psychology of education. Um, yeah, well, yeah, that was my degree. And, and when I think about it now, uh, I know a fellow okay. who has um, uh, where you can hook your brain up and see how, brain, how the brain is being lit up depending on what you're doing. And I always wanted to have him put me on uh, in the little brain scan while I was playing hurdy gurdy to see how it was affecting my brain versus versus other things. So that's it, it's probably a study that could be done if we can find funding for it. Probably, yeah. <laughs> we need to do that. Go yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In, in, instead of instead of a um a, a crowdfunding for the hurdy gurdy cafe podcast tour uh, around mm. Europe, we'll, we'll we'll fund this instead. <laughs> <laughs> some publicity anyway. like, i don't know back in the 80s like your brain on drugs uh -huh. um, your brain on hurdy goody <laughs> <laughs> more or less the same yes so tell us about some of your, your projects toby uh, you talked about the ensemble donkey what other kind of uh projects and are you involved in well this year very few because yeah. there's a pandemic going on in the all kinds of in an ideal um, world when what are you involved but, in in an ideal world, it, it varies a lot from year to year. Um, I, in the last years, I've often been invited as a soloist to work with other, with other groups, mm -hmm. which is always really, really exciting, actually, just to go and work with new people who come from different backgrounds very often. Um, a couple of years ago, I was playing with a modern chamber orchestra, um, which, does, which works with Baroque bows, but on modern instruments. And it's really a, it's a, set, a set orchestra. Um, they're really... So it means they play you know, every week, they play, mm -hmm. they play together, and it's just a really di different experience. Um, so a lot of things like that. And I'm working quite a bit still in the field of medieval music as well, okay. with different groups around Europe. I work a lot with a group called Personat in Germany, um, doing a range, of, a range of things, actually. The, we often, we've been doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of work with a specific program based on um, music from Cistercian nuns. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, okay. so that's what's a that completely like? different world. Yeah, I mean, what's that? What what is the quality of that? <laughs> well, I mean, the quality the quality of that it's maybe less it's much less hurdy goody oriented than okay. um, mm -hmm. than most of my other projects. So, and sometimes I don't even actually don't even play hurdy goody in that project. I'm also a singer, mm -hmm. so. Um, but mm -hmm. often, often I'm playing and singing and. The, I think one of the interesting things about a project like that is it's dealing with quite old sources, um, mostly 13th century, but a bit older and a bit, a bit later. And it's music that was really sung by women. And uh, mm -hmm. these women were, were cloistered and they were really not visible to the, to, to, to the public. You know, if they were singing, it was always, they were always hidden. Um, so that's, that's sort of a completely different world, actually. Mm -hmm. and, I've done a lot of um, a lot of projects again of 17th century music, which is not so hurdy goody centered. Um, but yeah, work really various different groups of medieval music around right. more more with hurdy goody. Yeah, yeah, and, and a lot um, of teaching in the last years. <clears throat> well, before we move on with uh, some more of our questions here, why don't we take a moment to listen to the second track that uh, you wanted to feature today? So, if you wouldn't mind. 
appropriately pronouncing that <laughs> for us and telling us a little bit about it. Um, so the second track is taken from the Chez de Ville arrangements of Vivaldi's Four Seasons mm-hmm. called Le Printemps ou Les Saisons Amusantes, which means the spring or the happy, funny seasons. I'm not sure what the best English word would be, amusing seasons. The amusing seasons, yeah. Um, um, Vivaldi wrote Four Seasons, Chez de Ville wrote Six. Okay. Oh. Is he Indian? <laughs> How did he get six, six seasons? Well, you know, you get some pleasures going on and <laughs> uh, this particular <laughs> as extra seasons. And um, this particular season is the harvest, la moisson, okay. and it's the third movement. <laughs> So we're back, uh, season two of the Hurdy Gurdy Cafe podcast with Toby Miller, and we do have Sergio Gonzalez again. Hello, Sergio. Hello. It was a nice track, eh? Well, yes. Tell us about it. So what inspired you uh, to, to feature this track? Um, the Saison Amusante, so, so, the, so the Four Seasons arranged by Chedeville, is probably one of the more well-known works for Hurdy Gurdy in the 18th century. And um, contrary to what we tried to do with the first CD of, uh, of the ensemble, it's, it's actually a work that's already been recorded. Um, and I was asked many times to play some concertos with different groups. And every group that I worked with would rearrange these pieces. So keep in mind that Chedeville already rearranged them. He took, um, 
he took Vivaldi's concertos and made his own and arranged them for hurdy-gurdy and strings or violin with flute. And then most groups today are usually actually led by recorder players mm. and they want to have more solos. So they rearrange everything so that it becomes a, a sort of concerto grosso where, where the, the solo parts are divided between all the instruments. And I realized that nobody had actually recorded these pieces as they were written, which mm. is one solo instrument and orchestra, well, orchestra, which yeah. it's one to a part, but um, so on, on a, with an ensemble. And I thought, okay, I think, I think I just have to do it this way because I was actually a bit tired of being asked to play these pieces and then saying, oh, but actually you play only the first movement and uh. like half the solos and not the second movement because we don't want to have a drone instrument on a slow movement. Uh. Um, and then the third movement, only one solo because they, actually the recorders all want to play some things. And, <laughs> and I thought, come on. Like, <laughs> It's, it's written this way, and there's a fantastic recording which my colleague Matthias Leubner made many years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the same thing. They, they, they just, you know, they took all the solos, and it's nice to let everybody play, but it's really the only thing we have in the repertoire that's, that's like this. Right. A series of six, six concertos, um, really written in a soloistic way. And, I mean, to be honest, I think Chedeville actually had the musette in mind. They're written for hurdy-gurdy or musette. Mm -hmm. um, and as a musette player, I think... And looking at the writing as well, I think they're maybe more suited to the musette, um, hmm. but that's not my instrument. So. Right, right. So you just decided to take charge and, and play it how it was supposed to be played to yeah. define it for hurdy-gurdy players in the future. This yeah, nice. and also for myself, actually, that yeah. I, just wanted, I just wanted to play the pieces like they were written and do it as a CD. And I'd been um, invited to play, to play with a group in Canada, actually as written, but not all of the pieces. And I thought, okay, it's the moment to do it. And mm -hmm. in the end, the CD wasn't actually ready before those concerts. So mm -hmm. that was a shame, but but we did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it's beautiful. I mean, that, that whole, yeah, it's wonderful. <laughs> I, one of my questions I have later on is um, uh, if, if someone wants to play like you and get the sound similar to you, how would you advise it? But the more I listen to you talk and hearing about your family and how you grew up in music, it seems like you're kind of an incarnation of music. <laughs> so <laughs> um, it, it might be difficult. What's do you want that? me to answer that question now or you want to save it? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, answer it now. Yes. <laughs> yes, tell um, us now. Okay. I think this is actually not an easy question to answer because I don't think you can play like somebody else. Okay. I think we are all individuals and we all have to find our own way of playing. This is um, a very wise uh, sentence. Yes, that's completely uh, true. <laughs> I remember in my studies... I, I hated having teachers who wanted me to play like them, who would mm. say, no, 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 just do it this way. I really, I really needed to find my own way. Um, mm. And for me, it's never my goal as a teacher. Um, and I actually also studied pedagogy. That's mm. one, of the, one of the many, many diplomas I got over the years. Um, it's never my goal as a teacher that my students should, should imitate me and play like me. I want to help them find their own, their own way. That said, if you want to play Baroque music on the hurdy-gurdy, um, I think it's important to go back to the sources. The, my number one piece of advice is read the methods. The, um, mm -hmm. Of course, in French, if you don't read French, it's a bit, it's a bit more difficult. I know there is a translation of, I think, of Dupuis that's available. It's not fantastic. It has some errors, but it at least gets you going in the right, in the right direction. Um, but also to take it in the context of other music at the time, because you have to keep in mind that Baroque music, like any style of music, is a language. And you have to learn that, you have to learn that language, at least to be, to be comfortable, and it takes a while. Right. And the hurdy-gurdy methods are just sort of one little glimpse at that, at that language. And they're written for people that were already fluent in the musical language of the time. They're not mm. written for people in the 21st century. I almost said 20th century. Um, right. 21st <laughs> century trying to learn how to play this music for the first time so there's a lot of there's a lot of important information about performance practice but you have to keep in mind that the um, the sort of more uh, sometimes referred to as the more noble instruments of of the day who had a more diverse repertoire there um, the methods for those instruments give you a bit of a broader context mm -hmm. So I would always recommend to listen to other instruments playing French Baroque music mm -hmm. okay. to get more of a sense of what this language is. Because the danger with the hurdy-gurdy 
I make a lot of actually a lot of parallels to the recorder in this is that a lot of people who a lot of recorder players for example play early music because they play the recorder not because not that they play the recorder because they want to play early music mm, right? I and see. i think with the hurdy gurdy it's quite a it's sort of a similar situation um that that's okay i play the hurdy gurdy so i'll play early music and Sometimes you end up with things that are really typical of the instrument, like ways of ornamenting, sort of also ticks even that we have in our playing. And those are really specific to the instrument. There's just things that fit easily in the fingers. And they're not necessarily things that were used at that time. Mm. They're sort of things that come to us from playing folk music and the the great the great things to have in our musical vocabulary on the right. instrument. But right. they're not relevant to that. Um, so I don't know. It's like it's like reciting Shakespeare coming from I don't know modern modern theater or something like that or theater in another language. It's just it's all the things that we have in our cultural background today that people didn't have then. They had a different background. Right. So as musicians, we have to somehow, if we're interested in historical performance, we have to get closer to that. Mm -hmm. So to try to answer your question, <laughs> <laughs> my brain <laughs> is uh... <laughs> a long detour. Um, I think read the sources, listen to recordings, but not just hurdy goody recordings. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to recordings of other instruments, people who've really studied Baroque music. Right. Um, and take lessons because a lot of that, a lot of that, I mean, the pioneers of our, of our age, at least for other instruments, they really did discover how to play this music from reading the, reading the treatises, reading the mm -hmm. methods. Mm -hmm. um, um, it's great, well, but... I think we lost Sergio again. Yeah, I don't know where he went. He'll be back. <laughs> um, Maybe that was too much for him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he shut down. <laughs> Let's oh, see. Yeah. There so, he is. So yeah, take lessons, come to workshops. Yeah. Um, I think that's... You, you talk about, I, I understand the idea of, of we are all individuals and we have to kind of find our own way, but uh, you know, maybe this is just a mistake I've made previously learning instruments. I've always found that if I had someone that, that I, I, I looked up to or I wanted to learn to play that way, if I sort of tried to learn what they were doing and, and, and I guess I would definitely imitate them, that that helped me get my, uh, get the music under my fingers. And, and so I could explore upon it later, but you're saying, what, is that okay? Or would you recommend just from the very beginning, not, a, not approaching it in the sense of imitating someone else? Poof. Does that question make sense? It's yeah, a good it question. Sorry? No, no, I said it's a good question. It's a good question, yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a really good question um, because I'm about to contradict myself. <laughs> hey, you're <laughs> a human. I think, this is life. I, think, I mean, I think whether we like it or not, when we are learning something new, there is always a, um, a part of it that is imitation. Uh -huh. um, but I think there's a difference between imitating elements or, mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, I always come back to this, that music is, is language. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe that's because I started out with Suzuki violin at a right. really young age. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the principles of that pedagogical method mm -hmm. is that we learn music the same way we learn language. And that's why they start children so young because we have this um, capacity to learn language as we learn our mother tongue until we're about five years old. Mm -hmm. And then that capacity diminishes until we're adults. So it sort of gradually becomes less and less. And that's why a child or a teenager will still learn a foreign language faster than an adult, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, which doesn't say it can't be done. But I think that language acquisition is, a, is still based on imitation. We hear sounds and we try to repeat them and we try to imitate them. And I think that's an important element. It's the same when we're learning to play an instrument and we're, we're learning a style of music. And I think that's a different sort of imitation as saying, now imitate my interpretation of this piece. Right. Sure. I see. Yeah. One of the best teachers I had um, when I was studying, actually still in Montreal, was my first, my first recorder teacher after I gave up on the modern flute and decided it was early music all the way. And she said to me, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I want you to go home and read this method. And then I want you to come back and convince me in your playing. Okay. And questions, and then we can discuss it. Huh. But I'm not going to tell you how to do this. So it was something like, show me your interpretation of this. Yes, yeah. but having read the source. Of course, to develop, yeah, like your your own kind of uh, your own voice. This is this is so nice. To, 
Exactly. And also that every source is exactly that. It's a source. You can't have a discussion with Dupuis or with Boin and say, what did you actually mean about this, mm. about this <laughs> sentence? Unfortunately, I mean, I don't know if there's a way to, <laughs> to communicate. With, um, we could have a seance at the next uh, festival. <laughs> Yeah, we can't have that discussion. So there is this, always a sense of reading um, reading sources that is open to interpretation. And when I read something or somebody else reads something, we're always going to take away something slightly different from it. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of passages in the method books that are not clear. Um, it's always okay. like that. And the other thing to keep in mind um, in methods is sometimes they tell you not to do something. And of course, they're telling you not to do it because people were doing it. Mm. <laughs> right. well, of course, of course, it makes sense. Yes. <laughs> so, there, I mean, there are so many things. And a method from the 18th century is not something, I mean, it's something, how, how could I describe that? The ideas that are written down in a method are not just the ideas that Dupuis had in 1741. I um, it's a combination of the kind of learning process up until that point. Exactly. So yeah. you always have to imagine that it um, that the what he describes is something that's applicable to maybe the twenty years before that. Right. That he's not writing at the beginning of his career. Actually, all of his works were published in the same year. Mm -hmm. mm. Um, interestingly enough, I don't, I'm not sure why, but he's not just saying, "Okay, in 1741 we do it like this." He's mm -hmm. talking. He's writing from from the point of view of somebody who's 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 had a career who's well, in his from career. his experiences yes. from his experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, and 17, the 1740s is already getting quite late, you know, so it's not the beginning um, of the hurdy gurdies revolution in the 18th century. It's, right. you know, it's already been around. And so, so he's writing with a lot of experience and a lot of background mm -hmm. and things that he says, okay, do this like this, don't do it like this. It's always a reaction to what his students have been doing or what he sees other people doing mm -hmm. or his work <laughs> together with Don Guy. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so, when, when you talk about uh, music as a language, I, I hadn't really thought about that until probably a few years ago. Um, you know, when I was learning music, I would just learn a, a tune or I would learn a, a piece and I would just play it based on how I memorized it or what I was doing within that group. Then it occurred to me, like you're saying, uh, individuals whom I met who started playing really early, it's like they think, they think about it differently. They're not thinking about it in the sense of, okay, these are the exact notes I need to play they're thinking about mm -hmm. this is what I hear I know how to translate it to my instrument so it, it comes out in the same way that they speak yeah um, so I'm curious for people because many people are coming to the hurdy-gurdy now not as a kid um, is there a way to work that in for an adult is there a way to make that that kind of capacity there for an adult who's learning to play this music or play the hurdy-gurdy um, I think there is. I think just some things come. Some things come in a different way if you learn them as a child, okay. and some things just take time. So you actually can't compare an adult who's maybe just started learning with somebody who started playing as a child or as a teenager because they've actually just played longer. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I was an adult when I started to play hoody goody. Just, just to say that. Yeah, but you already knew. You already knew music. I mean, you yeah. knew. Mm -hmm. scales you knew modes you, you knew how you knew what it's supposed to sound like so once mm -hmm. you figured out where those notes were on the hurdy-gurdy I would assume that you could kind of apply what you've learned from from other instruments yeah. right and I mean it's true that if I think but I think that goes for anybody who's played another instrument mm -hmm. um, that it's always easier to learn a second or third instrument mm -hmm. and I think I think you can basically learn anything um, that's on maybe sounds a bit a bit mm, but I think mm -hmm. a lot of it is about how much time and effort you put into it. Right. And I have mm -hmm. an adult student, for example, um, right now who's so enthusiastic and she came with zero background. I mean, she'd been playing for a few years, but never had a proper foundation on the instrument. And I taught her a couple of years at workshops and she sort of, she approached me after the second, the second workshop and she said, look, I would really like to just take some, some private lessons. And she's fantastic. She takes two hour lessons and then she practices two or three hours a day. She just, every day. And she practices everything with a metronome. Um, she does everything I ask her to do. She's really the model student and she can really play, you know? And it's, and at the beginning she thought I was, she, I remember her saying, I'm never going to be able to do this and learning scales and arpeggios and, all these elements of technique and of theory that she'd never had before. 
mm-hmm. and they're there. And a lot of that is just how you apply yourself. Right. And I think the brain works differently as an adult and as a child, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it as an adult. It just means you maybe need a different road to get there. Right. I mean, the brain has what they call neuroplasticity, so it can yeah. change and grow and, and, and learn new things even as an adult. And it's probably, I mean, I've thought about this many times, learning an instrument, even as an adult, it's so good for your brain and your health yeah. because it, it balances your nervous system. It helps you, I don't know, get in tune with yourself. So, yes. Yeah, it keeps you awake I'm, and yes. learning things. Yes. yes. Yeah. Even, and like you, you mentioned the metronome. I think if someone would just sit down with a metronome and play with a metronome, that's doing something to the left and right side of your brain as you're playing a melody and, and kind of staying consistent with that time. And I think it would make people happier and healthier if they just use the metronome. <laughs> yeah, a lot of people hate it. I mean, I remember as a child. A lot of people hate it, yes. <laughs> we call it the metronome treatment. You know? It was like when the piano teacher said, no, no, you have to play this with the metronome. And, oh, no. Well, for um, some reason, if you, you know, the metronome is always changing. You know, you're trying to play along with it. And for some reason, it's speeding up and slowing down. It's really weird. <laughs> it's not no. you eh? it's the metronome <laughs> I remember, I remember a, a tip from the from the great American hoodie goody teacher Artie Taylor okay oh Artie um, shout out to Artie if you're if you're listening I remember him suggesting to beginners to um to pick some like classic rock huh. song, you know like he would take Beach Boys or something and say okay now we practice trompet to this and yes, that's a good idea. If you can't stand playing with a metronome, right? Then take Scott, something that's recorded with a metronome and play along with it. You know, yeah. Scott Marshall does that with Black Sabbath. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. That's good. Yes. And uh, today, uh, of course, uh, if, if you guys don't like metronome, I, I use a lot of uh, percussion loops, for example. This uh, also helps uh, a lot, at least for the kind of music that I play, which is more like uh, Middle East and uh, and stuff. It's fantastic to keep to keep the like the groove. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Where do you where do you find your loops at, Sergio? I mean, I, I sometimes I, I, get on YouTube and kind of. No, no, no. I I just ask friends. Uh, oh, record I record the loop for me. <laughs> I got you. That's and then I have like, like a big folder with all, yeah. all the nines, the sevens, the fives, the, yes, everything. So if, if you uh, need some of them, just. Uh, that would be great. Them. Send them yeah. my way, at least. I, w- I would love that. So before we, we move on, um, we've got another track we're going to listen to. And this is um, Red Storm, correct? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and have a listen to it. And then you can tell us about it when, when we come back. Sound good? All right. So here we go. This is Red Storm by Gregory Jolivet.
we're back at season two of the Hardy Gritty Cafe podcast with Toby Miller and Sergio Gonzalez. And we've just got done listening to a track called Red Storm. Uh, what can you tell us about this track, Toby? Um, so this is, um, this is from Grégory Jolivet's last CD, his latest CD, Osmose. And um, this track actually was dedicated to me. I was... Whoa. Oh, that's what is that? So this, yeah, he dedicated this composition to me. Um, and it's, it's the only time anybody's ever done something like that, actually. I was very, I was very touched. Yeah. And it's a great tune. Um, and the CD is fantastic. It's all inspired um, by the, the work he's been doing with osmosis mm -hmm. and all of this underwater holding your breath and diving and, and things which I can only begin to imagine. And Gregory has been really, um, is somebody I'm really inspired by and I've had a lot of communication with over the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. And we sort of, we, we, just, we discuss all things from music to pedagogy to all sorts of things. Um, and he's he's a fantastic hoodie goody player, fantastic musician, really nice person. So yeah, I think this is for me. This is just really inspiring, and it's of course a completely different direction to most of the work I'm doing these days. Right. Um, I mean, just yeah, just to say that I I mean I'm working mostly in early music, and to hear what he's doing with his modern modern compositions and electronics and things, it's just for me, it's completely inspiring. Mm -hmm. It's an amazing track. Yeah, it's definitely, definitely amazing. Um, and I'm assuming he is one of your inspirations, which would lead us to one of Sergio's questions. Yes, my favorite question, which is yes. give us names, names. Give your names. Uh, we, <laughs> I'm sure everybody <laughs> gets the same names. <laughs> yeah, actually, yes, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, inspirations. Well, Greg is definitely definitely up there um, as one of my big inspirations and you know we're the same more or less the same generation but he started playing much younger so I remember just starting out um, just starting out with concerts and he was you know he had already published his alto solo cd mm. and uh, which I remember listening to when I was going to teach at the over the water festival in New Seattle in the US mm. and listening to that with Scott Gaiman as well in the car and thinking wow this is just this is just so cool and so modern <laughs> and so in the moment. So I really love, I really love his work. Mm -hmm. um, another huge inspiration for me and probably lots of people is of course Valentin Clastrier. Mm -hmm. Of course. He is the father of the modern, modern hurdy gurdy um, for me. He's really the first one, first one there to, and to take the instrument out of its traditional, out of its traditional clothing. And he tells stories, you know, that he heard it and said, okay, cool instrument but it could do something else hmm. and he's you know he's still in that momentum um after after so many years of career and still writing new pieces he's somebody i've worked with quite a bit as well um both as a musician and as a translator actually um well, not a professional translator but so he's somebody I know, I know very well, and I've spent a lot of time really just at his side, um, translating and you know hearing his work up close, up close and personal. And he's just he's just incredible. Yeah. Um, another inspiration for me is Matthias Leubner, who's somebody I've also worked with quite a bit, and who really again took took an instrument folk instrument and you know being in a bubble more or less and just reinvented it reinvented the wheel more or less and <laughs> never really looked back and said oh maybe traditionally at least at the beginning maybe traditionally it should be done like this and just found his own way mm -hmm. and I think he's somebody who just always is finding an expressive way of playing um, it's just always touching always beautiful and always his own his own voice so he's he's really fantastic a um, couple more, maybe? Have yeah. Yes. Yeah. Do you have Herman a couple more? <laughs> David, also a really good, really good friend, amazing person. Who is that? And Herman Diaz. Oh, yeah. Ah, Herman, yes. yes. Fantastic, fantastic hoodie goody player. And again, just taking the instrument outside of, you know, thinking outside of the box. And he is one of the most, or maybe the most solid technique of anybody. Anybody I know, um, and yeah, he's just he's just always an inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe 
maybe I would say as an inspiration as well, somebody who's not a hurdy goody player and actually not living anymore um, would be Jean Christophe Maillard, mm. who was a very, um, very prolific uh, musette player. Mm. And he was a mentor to me up until his death a few years ago. Oh, yeah. So I used to go. I have. Um, I used to go to Toulouse to work with him, um, which is also where I have a lot of my family. And so I just sort of. I just started by me getting in touch and saying, "Look, I'm. I'm going to be in town to see my family. Could we maybe meet? Could I take a lesson?" Um, and he just. He was there supporting me all the way. And even. Even when we did the first Tongi CD, the Belvieux, he was really there helping me out and making suggestions when, with the planning and, you know, giving me, giving me names of people to contact when I had questions about different musicological things because he was also a musicologist. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, and a fantastic musician. Really. And the, the musette, for people who don't know, that's like a small bagpipe, correct? That's the Baroque bagpipe. The, so, you know, when I'm talking about the, the French Baroque hoodie goody, that's the cousin instrument of that. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. So it's a bellows blown instrument. Um, with uh, with shuttle drones and and it was actually probably the well it was yeah it was a, it was the cousin instrument and it was often in the 18th century it was more often played by men hmm. um, whereas the hurdy goody on an amateur level was more played by women. Hmm. That's interesting. Any reason why that you know of? <laughs> um, yes, I think it comes. Well, first of all, the musette became popular earlier than the hurdy goody. Okay. In high society, it was already, you know, in the 17th century, the musette already made appearances in opera um, and and you see it in, use in, um, in high society. And in general, in the 18th century, there was an idea that certain instruments were more suited to one gender or the other, mm -hmm. that it would not be sightly for a woman to play certain instruments, for example. So like wind instruments, and even though the musette is not blown with the mouth because that was also not really gentlemanly for the upper classes. Uh -huh. um, I think this carried over. And that's why you have instruments like the par-dessus de viol, which is the smallest viol that we have from the 18th century. And it's basically, at, it's in a violin range. And that was because it was not sightly for a woman to play violin resting, of course, here. Uh -huh. oh. <laughs> you know, costumes, uh, costumes, baroque dress uh, would have mm -hmm. been like, um, yeah. that might have been seen as provo provocative. Um, wow. And in any case, it was not culturally um, accepted. So they developed a viol, which is then tiny, in violin register to be played on the lap. Um, so I think it goes along, along with that, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with that actually. And the, somehow also you start a, a style of fashion and it sticks, so it became a fashion for the ladies to play the hoodie goodie. And they had their pictures painted <laughs> and, um, it could be played in a womanly fashion, you know, on your lap and right. whatever. Well, speaking of, speaking the, of, go ahead. The professionals were, of course, men, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, mm. um, Not today. <laughs> well, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> I was wondering whether or not we were going to get into this. Um, Let's get into it. Yes. You. I have to say that. I mean, the hurdy-gurdy world, if you look at the, the amateur scene and workshops and things, it's, there are a lot of women, but also a lot of men. It's quite, it's quite balanced. I mean, I don't know. Yes. Even workshops in Spain where there were only men in the workshop. I don't know what happened. What happened hmm. there? I, like the, last, the last Spanish workshop I gave, there were 13 men in my class and one woman for one afternoon. Huh. Um, but usually things are quite balanced, men and women. But the professional scene is really dominated by men. And I think that's changing in the last years with these sort of with these, these young girls like Patty, um, who's, you know, who's out there in the social media and and really making a name for herself. But when I first started out, um, I, I remember I, mean, I was always the only woman. We right. used to have meetings of professional hurdy gurdy players in Austria and it would be me and men. <sighs> and it always got complicated. We would, you know, we would be staying staying over and often it was sort of more or less camping or like in a you know in a room with mattresses on the floor. And if there was another woman, it was somebody's wife. <laughs> <laughs> so for me it's still, you know, aside from these sort of these young women who are now, I think they're making, you know, there there are changes coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but up until up until now, there are there are, there are very few there are very few women, or at least when I was starting out, there were very. Well, few. Why do you think that? I mean, do you have a theory on why that that was the case? Um, mm -hmm. I 
don't actually accept yeah. maybe i don't know maybe there's something about men liking to you know like work on instruments or i don't know i mean that's a really that's actually a really sexist thing to say and i don't <laughs> know if it's true but i do meet a lot of hurdy goody players male hurdy goody players who tell me things like oh yeah when i was a kid i was taking apart my dad's radio or my computer or something and maybe that's something about our personalities as hoodie goody players that there are more men who come to the instrument with that sort of uh, with that sort of background. I'm really not sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really I mean, not sure. Kind of makes it's sense. Something, yeah. It's something that preoccupied me for a while. I thought it's you know it's just really strange. I'm always I'm always the only woman. I mean I'm not the only woman. Of course there are other female hoodie goody players, yeah. um, professionals, but not many. Right. At least not of my generation or the generation before. Well, hopefully that's changing. I mean, it seems like it is based on what you've said. I think it is. And I mean, yes. I think it was already changing. I think it's been changing over the last 10 years or so. Mm. Um, I had a student for, for a while who was a hoodie goody player in one of these pagan folk bands in Germany. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's a big deal in, in other countries or if it's even still a big deal. I don't know. I think it is. But, I think, yeah, they're they, they still, still popular. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But so she was really, I mean, she was really a star, but it's a really specific. Right. It's a really specific sort of niche um, musical market, I guess. Well, also, hopefully, having possibly more ac accessibility to hurdy gurdies might make it easier. I mean, you know, with the nerdy gurdy and with yeah. uh, the ancestor doing their bit, making hurdy gurdies more available. I mean, maybe having them more available to people will make it easier because. Uh, you know, here in the U.S., there's one maker that we don't want to talk about, but uh, <laughs> getting something shipped from other countries, you know, a lot of people don't want to go through the hassle of doing that here. And so at least in the U.S., I'm thinking that as they become more available and in good quality, that maybe it'll it'll help even out the playing field a little bit. I hope so. I mean, I think that's always been it's always been a problem, especially in places without a, without a tradition of hoodie goody playing mm. and making. Yes. And I remember that was a really big thing when I started to play. Um, was that there was there was nothing around. I mean, I um, I actually started my first instrument was built by Alden and Kali Hackman. Mm -hmm. um, ah. Musical instruments who are not building anymore, but at the time they were the only builders in North America. And I got I bought a secondhand instrument for somebody from somebody living in Seattle, and it was just all it was sort of all chance actually um, that instrument became available and it was I mean it was a three stringed instrument with an octave and a half keyboard, Whoa. and that's that's all I had when I moved to Basel that was that was the only instrument I had. Wow. Um, and I learned to play like that no, uh -huh. no problem. But I remember at the time thinking, you know, how do I get how do I get an instrument? Because no matter what I get, it has to come from another country. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to ship it, and it's really expensive, and something could go wrong, and there's nobody there to fix it if something does go wrong. Right. Um, yeah, that's why I keep buying hurdy gurdies because I figure if one breaks, I can just <laughs> I just have another one I can use instead. Of <laughs> but it's it, it's not that you have gurdy acquisition syndrome. Like <laughs> no, no, it's, it's not Gertie acquisition syndrome. It's just, I know one will break one day and I'm going to need another one. <laughs> but, but this leads me to my final question for you. Um, what are, what are uh, the Gerties that you use now? You know, what, what, what kind of, um, uh, what hurdy Gerties are you using uh, when you do your recording, when you do a performance now? Um, I use different instruments for different types of music. Okay. So, um, I often think I would like to just have one instrument and play everything on it, but unfortunately, for what I do, that's not it's not realistic um, okay. because every style of music needs needs a different instrument, mm -hmm. um, and that's actually something I didn't mention when we were talking about recommendations for people wanting to play baroque music. Um, mm -hmm. Having a baroque instrument is a game changer. Okay. It's, okay. Interesting. If you want to play, it's like if you want to play traditional music and you play it on a modern on a modern gurdy with a big wheel and a and a modern setup, you can play it, but it's never going to sound really traditional. Mm. And it's the same thing with the baroque with the baroque music. You can play it on on any instrument, no problem. But the instrument doesn't give you that feedback. Right. Mm -hmm. helps so you. what is? I, I don't know the difference between a baroque hurdy gurdy and the the other options so what, what what would define a baroque hurdy gurdy uh well a baroque hurdy gurdy is i mean just to, in a completely general sense is either is an instrument that's um, that was built in the 18th century or a copy of an instrument okay. that was built at that time and the shapes that you see in french traditional instruments in the 19th century 
are based on that, um, but they're quite a bit bigger. And the bracing is different. The construction is different. I'm not a luthier, so I won't, I won't go into all of the details of what makes a traditional instrument different to a Baroque instrument. But the construction is, is completely different um, because okay. they're meant, a traditional instrument is meant to play outdoors for dancing with bagpipes. Um, and a Baroque instrument is meant to, play in, to be played indoors in a salon um, for chamber music. Mm -hmm. So it's a, diff it's a different beast. Is it quieter then? It's quieter and has a different sort of range of, of dynamics, I would say. The wheel is, the wheel is much smaller. It's it really meant also, for much. Uh, what about the, the scale length? It, it's smaller, right? Normally? Um, well, scale length is something that was not standardized in the 80s. Ah, OK. So for example, I mean, we'll say today that I'm a standard Soprano, um, just for lack of better better term, uh, scale length is um, 345 millimeters, yes. 34 and a half centimeters. Mm -hmm. um, in the 18th century, you have a lot of instruments with that scale length, but you also mm -hmm. have a lot of instruments with a much smaller scale length. Even even smaller, eh? Oh, oh yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, interestingly, my first instrument also had a much smaller scale length. It was oh. really a real size instrument. Mm -hmm. The Americans were always joking. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> But um, but yeah, in the 18th century, you have a lot of instruments with a, with a smaller scale length, and some of those would I mean the smallest ones are really children's instruments, and they're tiny. Mm -hmm. Even for me, I mean, I played on an original children's instrument and a copy of it many years ago. Okay. And I really thought I'm not even sure I could, and I have quite small hands, and I really thought, wow, this is at the <laughs> limit. But there were also a lot of vielle de dame, so women's hurdy gurdies being made. Vielle de dame. Yeah, nice. With nice. a slightly smaller scale length. And I have to say, you know, playing a lot of the Dupuis pieces, for example, with really big extensions, I think it's nice. I mean, I would love to one day have an instrument with a smaller scale length. <laughs> I think it's not for a man with big hands, you know, like, mm. you know, <laughs> because the top, the, the notes of the top of the register. This is are, impossible. Eh? Yeah. I'm very close together. Um, so, yeah, a Baroque instrument also usually has a much lighter setup. And of course, you can set up any instrument that way. But when you when you, when you use that adjective lighter, what do you mean? Like, when um, you say lighter, like lighter strings lighter or strings, so less tension. Okay. Really, and balance between the strings that suits the music you're playing. So when you're playing baroque music, it's a um, it's a really big a really, really big difference with other music. Is that the trompette for us in baroque music is articulation? No. Oh. It's not. It's not percussion. Um, with the exception of if you play a tambourin movement, which is, you know, where you're allowed to imitate the drum sticks on the, on the drum, uh, the, the sticks of the drum. Otherwise, the trompette is articulation. And so when you're using that terminology, are you saying that it's not necessarily there to keep the rhythm, it's there to accent things? Is that what that means? It's there to bring out important notes. Yeah, it's okay. there to, for phrasing, um, basically. Okay. And so you you have to really make sure that the trompet is not too loud. Um, it has to be mm. it has to be quiet. And for me, the drones also have to be soft enough that they're not getting in the way of the harmony. That they're like a carpet supporting mm. everything, but they're not. They 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 can't overpower everything else, because the problem you have, for example, when I'm playing together with a harpsichord, um, is that the sound of the hurdy gurdy is like a. It's like a it's like a carpet. I mean, it doesn't matter how much you articulate, you have the most sustained sound of anybody in the ensemble. So you have to articulate, of course, a lot, both with the left and the right hands. Um, it's a bit of another topic. Mm -hmm. And you have to find a way of blending with the other instruments that you still hear everything. And if the drone and the trompets are too present, then you lose that. And I've often had people ask me on recordings, yeah, and you recorded the slow movement without any drone at all. And I think, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a drone, but it was really soft. And then, of course, you have the problem of recording, which is a whole other, it's a whole other beast, which is, mm. you know, how the drone and the trompet come into the microphone, which is a complicated thing in itself. Um, right. Okay. So, yeah, so it's, a, it's just a different setup. And right. to be able to play this, you know, to be able to do these sort of subtle nuances, dynamics and elements of phrasing that you need for chamber music, you need a setup that works for that. And that setup doesn't work, for example, for playing like for a Balfork, no way. Totally, totally, yeah. And it's, it's vice amazing. versa. And I always, I often tell this story about how, I, I, you know, I would go to teach at hurdy-gurdy workshops and festivals, and I don't come at all from the field of traditional music. 
I have completely not answered your question, but I'll come back to it. Um, <laughs> That's all right. And I didn't even know, I didn't know anything about what the traditional music of the hurdy-gurdy was when I started to play. I imagined all sorts of modern things I would do, a bit of medieval music. I did not imagine I would play Baroque music, actually. Mm. Um, and I just, I just had no idea. And I remember, you know, years later going back to teach and having a bit of a complex, you know, that everybody would play at sessions and the common repertoire for the hurdy-gurdy is sort of a bad folk repertoire. And I've never owned a traditional hurdy-gurdy in my life, actually. <laughs> and thinking, wow, I just, I don't manage to play it in the right, exactly the right style. You know, I play like, I play, I play the right notes. I play it with, with a nice groove, but it doesn't sound, it doesn't sound like the real thing. And then somebody put a traditional instrument in my hands and I thought, ah, oh, this is how it works. Oh, <laughs> and, that was a trick. <laughs> and it's a huge part of it. And if you play Baroque music on a traditional instrument or a modern instrument, you're missing that part of the communication, which is what the, it doesn't mean you can't do it, mm -hmm. but you're not helping yourself. And right. there's always going to be a little bit, something that's like, it's not quite right because the instrument doesn't give you the same feedback. Well, I mean, that would be like me trying to play, you know, Andrei Vinogradov stuff on an instrument that he's not playing it on in a way, you know, the, the style that he's using, it just wouldn't quite work. Um, but you bring up a very good point. Um, the idea that, and I don't, I don't think we've talked about this on other podcasts, Sergio, that when people are, are considering what, what kind of hurdy-gurdy to get, they really need to consider what style of course, it's they're important. wanting to focus on. You know? And so you're bringing up a very good point there, Toby. I think for a beginner, that's a really difficult question to answer, though. I think for, for a beginner, the most important thing is just to have a good instrument that works. And you don't need anything fancy. You don't need any, any extras. I mean... Mm -hmm. I started with three strings and not even two octaves, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. no problem. But the instrument was a good instrument. It had a nice right. sound. It was well built. And I think that's the most important thing. And once you get playing, you get a sense of what repertoire. And then you really have to ask yourself that question. Right. And as I said, I didn't, I didn't plan to play Baroque music on the hurdy-gurdy. For me, the hurdy-gurdy was something I was going to have sort of as a hobby for other things. Um, and then quite soon into playing, I, I was hired to put together some Baroque programs. And I started to... Um, I started to do that and I thought, oh, okay, actually, this is, this is what I have to do. But so you're, so you're saying, you know, they need to get a good solid instrument, get that under their belt, uh, into their fingers. And then once they figure out if, I, if they want to go a certain route, then start considering what kind of party grade you might work with that best. I think so. I mean, yes. sometimes you meet a student who's starting out and they know exactly what they want. And then I say, go for it, you know? I have a student who immediately said, okay, she wants to have a Weichselbaumer tenor like mine. <laughs> okay. You know, she's already a musician. She plays Indian music. She knows what she wants. She practices a lot. And I thought, actually, that's a, that's a huge gift to start off on an mm. instrument with those capacities, capabilities. Right. Um, but that's not for everyone. And some people would be, would be completely overwhelmed by that. Totally. Yes, yes, yes. So... And I think that also, and I think if you have a teacher close by who's helping you and can troubleshoot and help with the setup, that also makes a big difference. But I mean, I think it's, I think it's like a lot of things. Start off with a basic model from a good maker. Right. Um, right. And, then, and then move up from there. <laughs> so to answer your first question. Yes, the, back to the question <laughs> about what do you play? To answer my first, your first question. Yeah. Um, for, let me start chronologically. There you okay. Go. So, <laughs> For medieval music, I have two instruments at the moment. Um, I, have a, I have a symphonia, which is made by Chris Allen in Wales. Okay, yes. And um, it's, it's similar to the symphonias which he offers, but he did a lot of sort of custom, um, custom work for me to have it more like the instruments that we see in the iconography. Mm. So, um, just, but just a really basic instrument, which I use for earlier programs mm. um, and for accompanying myself singing sometimes, um, for example. And then for later medieval music, I have a cantico made by Weichselbaumer. Uh -huh. But again, it's sort of a special instrument. Um, so it's based on the cantico model he has is based on 14, a 14th century image from the iconography. So it's sort of a fiddle-shaped instrument, like almost, not quite a figure eight, but almost almost like a guitar-shaped instrument. Okay. But what we know about medieval stringed instruments um, is that they're often carved from one piece of wood. Huh, really? So yes, 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 totally. Yeah. You see this with fiddles as well. And I mean, we know this from other woodworking, like you see cupboards and things that are, that are carved like this. 
you take a piece of wood and you hollow it out. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And yeah. today, people often do that with a drill, first of all, just to get wood out. Um, I do that. <laughs> but he did mine by hand. Ooh. <laughs> it's dedication. That's dedication, and you build a lot of muscle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well. <laughs> so that's the instrument I have, which I use for 14th and 15th century music. Um, and again, and these are instruments set up purely with gut strings. And just to keep in mind that wound gut strings didn't exist at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so with, like for low strings, they're really thick strings. Mm -hmm. it's, really, it's really a very special setup. Mm -hmm. um, so that instrument, again, is, yeah, it's carved out of one piece of wood. It's a very, very special, very special instrument. Wow. Um, for Baroque, in Baroque music, I play on a copy of an instrument by Jean Louvet, who was um, probably the most prolific maker of the 18th century. And it's again a copy by Weichselbaumer. Mm -hmm. And that's the instrument I've had the longest. I've had it for almost as long as I've been in Basel, a long time. Mm -hmm. And it's a guitar-shaped guitar -shaped instrument. I think the original is from 1763, so it's quite late, sort of. Um, and that's, that's the instrument that, you'll hear, that you hear on all of the Donghi CDs. And for everything else, I play on a lovely modern tenor instrument, also Weichselbaumer. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's set up with, with gut strings, but with wound gut strings. Right. So ah, when okay. I play Bach, for example, that's what I use. I use a setup. I use strings that you would have on a Baroque viola, for example. So Did you just say you use wound gut strings? Is yes. that what you just said? Yes. So I've never even heard of that. So the problem you have with gut strings is to, is, um, to have a lower pitch, you need more mass. Uh -huh. And so the lower you get, the thicker the string. So they're twisted? Is that what you mean? Mm. Uh, the, the core, no. the core so, is, is, is the gut. And then you have the... Oh, I see, I see, yeah. Just like so a normal... So what you have is you have a gut core. So yeah. this is something that was developed in the 17th century. Um, you have a gut core. And then around it, you have metal winding. Right, okay. And this makes the string heavier without being as thick. Right. So for the Bach CD, for example, um, that, was, that was one of the things I wanted to do is that I needed to play on a bigger instrument. There's no way I could play that repertoire on the Little Baroque on the little French Baroque instrument. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying, I wasn't trying to do something historically accurate in the sense of playing the right music on the right instrument, which is right. generally what we're going for with um, historical performance, historically informed performance. What I was going for was, first of all, to me, Bach is something universal. Bach, you, I mean, I grew up listening to Bach on every possible instrument. And it was just something, as a musician, you had to play Bach on your instrument. My father played Bach on his tuba. Um, I had recordings of Bach on marimba or whatever, <laughs> I don't know. And that was just, that's just to be a musician, you play Bach. And originally I never planned to record it. It was just something I was doing for myself. Um, and then, and of course I, did, I obviously did record it in the end. But what I was trying, what I was going for was somehow to find a, um, a meeting point of my work as somebody in historically informed performance, you know, trying, you know, looking at performance practice of early music, but somehow to combine that um, with the reality of playing it on an instrument is actually completely absurd for this music. <laughs> so for, for me, that meant using stringing that would have been appropriate for viola with the same string mm -hmm. length and using the techniques and the, and the style, stylistic things that I know from Baroque music, even if I was playing that on a modern instrument. But I don't know if that makes sense. It makes sense. It does, it does, yes. Trying to combine the two somehow. Okay, so it sounds like you're definitely a, uh, a fan of, of Wolfgang. <laughs> yeah, well, I have to say the first hurdy-gurdy I heard was one of his. So that was the sound for me from day one. Right. There was no, there was no escaping that. Um, yeah. But no, I love, I love his instruments, and um, we work quite closely together. I have a very good relationship with him, and I know I can always, you know, if I have a problem, I can always go to him. If there are things I would like to have done differently, he's very open to that. Um, yeah. He does a lot of experimentation. I often get to be a bit of a guinea pig for that. Yeah. Which I like a lot. <laughs> Well, excellent. Um, well, that'll bring us close, well, beyond our time, but it was a wonderful discussion. Sergio, do you have any final questions for? for as, uh, as always, I'm like like this, like yeah. with my, my ears open and I could stay like this all the day. 
Well, thank you very much for, for being here, Toby. I mean, you've shared so much and it's really wonderful to connect with you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. It's a pleasure. It was very nice. And we do have one final track that we're going to go out on. Um, tell us about this track, Toby. So this final track is from my Bach solo CD. And this is, I mean, I've, I think I've already told you a bit about that, the CD that, um, that I ended up making of my own Bach transcriptions. Mm -hmm. And this particular track is the Gavotte en Rondo. So it's a gavotte, which is a type of dance, and it's a, with a rondo form. So it always comes back to the same sort of um, refrain type of, type of melody. Mm -hmm. It's quite well known. It's from the E major violin partita um, and involves quite a bit of pizzicato on the drone strings as a way of um, getting around the fact that I can't really play two, otherwise play two notes at once. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my solution to this. Excellent. Well, let's have a listen. And again, thank you so much, Sergio. Thank you so much, Toby, for being here. Here we go. Yes. 